What is going on, my gorgeous opera lovers? Welcome to Opera Anna. My name is Anna. I am an opera singer, and I am here to opera up your life. Happy 2024, everybody. I hope you all enjoyed your Christmas, Hanukkah, everything break, or that you just took some time for yourself, you know? I know I've been gone for a hot second. It's been months, and I didn't know exactly where to start this new year. I had some things planned, but like editing them and trying to work on them just didn't feel right. I couldn't get into the groove until I realized that I had buckets of ARIA requests. Yes, buckets of requests from you guys just sitting in my Instagram DMs and in the comments. And so today we're starting with something that one of you requested. Coincidentally, it's also something that I've wanted to look at for a really long time. So that works out. So get ready because we are going to dinner. You invited me, right? Or at least the Comendatore says this in our Ari Explained Tonight coming from Mozart's Drama Giocoso, Don Giovanni, in the aria, A Cenar Teco Minvitasti, otherwise known as one of the most epic moments in opera. But we'll get there now. We have looked at this opera before, and since we have, I'm going to keep the synopsis more or less brief and or non-existent, but there are some juicy context bits that I really think that you should know. If you want to jump to the reaction, once I have edited all this, then I will put it right here. And it'll also be in the timestamps and all the things that YouTubers, good YouTubers do. Don Giovanni is none other than Don Juan, a character that has been written about almost ad nauseum. And I say almost because it really seems like people can't get enough of him, especially back in the day. Probably because of the clever treatment of mortal good versus evil intertwined with divine intervention. And of course, sex. Everyone knows sex sells, and who wouldn't want to see an objectively immoral character who continues to engage in socially deplorable behavior finally, finally be taken down, even if it is in an otherworldly manner. Not only was Mozart not the first composer to set Don Juan, or in this case, Don Giovanni, to music, but he also wasn't the second, nor the third, nor the fourth. You know, I have dinner plans. No, his opera was the eighth Italian opera that examined the story of Don Juan. Obviously, this story was very popular. It had been traveling throughout Europe since at least 1630, unpublished perhaps earlier. And in any case, much earlier than either librettist Lorenzo da Ponte or composer Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart's were even born. Just like this pair's other two collaborations, Le Notte di Figaro, The Marriage of Figaro, which we've looked at before on Opera Anna, which you can check out here, and Così Fan Tutte, which we still need to get to, but all right. Don Giovanni is, if nothing else, a commentary on the failings of the nobility. If nothing else, but of course it is. It's Don Giovanni's murdering of the Commendatore, likening to the devil as a sort of shapeshifter as he disguises himself to seduce even more women and subsequent demise into the literal pits of hell, facilitated not by any mortal character on stage, but a sort of reverse deus ex machina that are a none too subtle comment on the corrupt nobility roaming the streets of 18th century Europe. And who could expect anything else of Da Ponte and Mozart, one of whom was a notorious prankster and Freemason, (laughs) and the other not only friends of more than two decades with the literal real-life Casanova, but who also got himself banned from Venice for 15 years after reciting a poem attacking the ruling classes and publicly supporting the ideas of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And for those of you who don't know who that is, Rousseau argued that every man was born equal and society's imposition of class structure and inequality was artificial. So weird that the Emperor of Vienna didn't like him. So like... Da Ponte and Mozart were like a match made in heaven to ruffle the feathers of the aristocracy. And it didn't take long for them to start working together after they met, once Antonio Salieri, whose name you may recognize as having a hand in Mozart's death, Allegedly, allegedly, once Salieri introduced Da Ponte to Mozart, history was in the making. Their first opera, Le Notte di Figaro, was a huge 
huge success in Prague to the extent that Mozart was commissioned to write a new opera and Da Ponte's suggestion of Don Giovanni for the commission was spot on. So inspired was Da Ponte about this new opera that he worked on it together with two other libretti, quote, one for Salieri, one for Marini, and one for Mozart. Between the toque, the tobacco, and my young muse, I wrote the first two scenes of Don Giovanni in a day and completed the three operas in 65 days. Listen, whoever said alcohol, smoking, and sex is bad for your concentration apparently never met Lorenzo da Ponte. And I think these kinds of examples are just all of the evidence that we need to know that technology is sucking the concentration out of our lives. Um, but please continue watching this video and consider subscribing. <laughs> Now that I've made the case for no technology. Okay, but do please subscribe. We're trying to get to 5,000 subscribers. And look how aesthetic this video is right now. Like, I'm in my Steve Jobs turtleneck era right now. And like, the lighting is just gorgeous. So, here we go. A Cenarteco Minvitasti comes at the finale of the finale of the opera Don Giovanni. Don G has spent the entire opera jumping from girl to girl to girl while Donna Elvira, his wife, his wife has been going around trying to cock block him for lack of a better word. They were married for three days, three days before Don Giovanni abandoned her, which as far as I can tell is his longest relationship to date. In the first scene of the opera, the first scene, you guys, well, technically the second scene of Don Giovanni, but it's the first scene in which we see Don Giovanni. But all right. Don G kills the father of Donna Anna, who he was trying to... Um, force into consensual relations. If... I'm not sure. Yeah, something. But of course, Donji gets away with Leporello, his servant. Fast forward to Act 2, which finds both of them in a cemetery where Don Giovanni is recounting his latest almost victory encounter with a woman to Leporello. This is where part of the shape-shifting of Don Giovanni comes in, and they hear a voice, a booming voice, no less, in a cemetery in the middle of the night. I would be scared, but Don Giovanni... Not so much. The voice warns Don Giovanni that he will regret his laughing by the time morning comes. And once they have a little look around see, they find that the statue of the Commendatore, which is apparently already there even though he died like three days earlier, if that. The things you can do if you're not looking at your computer the whole time, Jesus. They find none other than the statue of the Commendatore, whose inscription reads, here I wait for vengeance upon the impious man who caused my death. Now, if that weren't ominous enough, Don Giovanni tells Leporello to, quote, invite him to dinner. Foreshadowing. And then what happened? Here we go. Most iconic chord in opera, I think. Oh my god. And finally, for the first time ever on this channel, I introduce you to the one and only Basso Profondo, Kurt Moll. An unbelievable voice, an unbelievable actor, and the reason that I chose this recording. This scene is very long, so we're only sticking with him and the gorgeous Samuel Raimi as Don Giovanni. But once my Patreon goes up and goes live, hopefully on the 1st of February, that's what I'm shooting for, I will be looking at a couple others for those who are patrons, so look out for that. Now, I want you to listen to the spin on Kurt Moll's voice. And what I mean by that is, of course, the vibrato, the vibration in it, but specifically how solid that vibration feels. Not just because it's low, but because the spin on it, just like on a well-thrown football, is so tight. Oh, 
Ugh. Especially in the low notes, in the extreme lowness that he has, it's still like right there. It's like a black hole of sound. It's endless and so easy. And I just want to bring your attention for a hot second to the very beginning of this scene, scene which is 100% a sign of the modern stage times that we live in um, with those fuses going off. <laughs> right? He seems to come out of like hell. He seems to come out of like this thing of smoke or whatever. Um, the score only says that Leporello goes outside, sees the Commendatore, and sends Do Don Giovanni to see for himself. There's nothing about hell opening or fire spewing from the ground, which is quite often how it's presented nowadays. And I'm not saying I don't like it, because I think it's super dramatic and it, it works for sure. Uh, although the popping of the fuses on stage, like with this like popping effect, kind of ruins the effect, but um, you know, suspension of disbelief or whatever. Let's keep going. So much makeup for Court Mole in this. Oh my God. Let's stop for a second to look at Leporello and Don Giovanni together. It's a very short interaction, but even without having seen the whole opera before this, you can get a sense of both the characters of Don Giovanni and Le Porello as sole characters and in their relationship to each other. Obviously, calling Don Giovanni padron, Giovanni is his boss, his master, and is continuously throughout the opera attempting to be a voice of reason to Don Giovanni, telling him he's actually a gigantic a-hole for what he does to all the women he seduces, trying to put it in perspective for him, getting scared when a statue of the man that he killed like 24 hours ago appears to have dinner with him. But these interactions tell us that Don Giovanni is not unaware of the effect that he has. In fact, he rationalizes it time after time by saying it would be unfair to all women of the world, to all other women, if he was faithful to just one. I mean, I like your creativity, Don Giovanni, but I'm not sure anyone will agree with you. Thing is to keep smiling and never look as if you disapprove. It's just a thought. And now Don Giovanni barely blinks twice at this literal opposite deus ex machina showing up in his dining room. And his answer is to get another plate for the commendatore to have dinner. Pull up a chair! It's fine. It's fine. Meanwhile, Le Borello warns Siam tutti morti. We are all dead. Wrong again, Le Borello. As we go forward, keep your ears open for how different the Commendatore's music is written from that of Don Giovanni or Le Porello. The length of the notes, the number of pitches used, and we'll come back to it. But just listen. <laughs> Oh my God, Ugh, it's like a warm bath of sound. I love it so much. So, quote, he who dines on heavenly food has no use for the food of mortals. Kind of a weird sentence for someone who just was like, you've invited me to dinner, I'm here. Which means that this sentence should send a shiver of fear down Giovanni's spine. If you're not here for dinner, why are you here? On a technical phrasing level, the way he brings out mortale in this sentence is absolutely terrifying. Oh. 
it's so is. much mask in that and uh, uh it's just mortale like just disdain for the mortals now that he's moved into the beyond and his costume stunning gorgeous not just armor but oh god i almost choked on myself I'm too excited not just armor but ornately decorated armor with the chain going around I mean, it's clear that he was of high status, and I don't know of any symbolism, but you'll notice that Don Giovanni's outfit is similarly ornate as a nobleman. Absolute fire, this production. Just, I'm obsessed. All the same note. Okay, I think in that whole phrase, there were like three notes. What did I say? <laughs> he doesn't move around a lot. I mean, it's characteristics of Don Giovanni being made of stone. He's not going to move around a lot. He's not going to be like really limber or whatever. And it's also so much creepier because of it and scary that he doesn't move anywhere. It's just this this wall of sound, especially when it comes from someone as amazing as Kurt Mole. The thing that I need everyone to understand about this performance from Kurt Mole is the brilliance of his equalized vowels. Put it out so often because of how difficult it is to do. I've talked about it with Pavarotti, but there are so many different ways that it can go wrong as a beginning singer or, you know, someone who studied for years. Hello. I love what I'm being shady. I'm Everything is so smooth and legato and there's an imperceptible, if any, loss of resonance between the words, between the different vowels. And I'm still stuck on the word altra because he takes his sweet damn time twice on that L, which any singer will tell you is the, the consonant of death, especially for an American, or Russians tend to have very thick L's as well. It's so thick it would shut down my throat faster than you can say chiaroscuro. And here he is using it to connect the vowels to create an even more perfect legato and make it even more understandable. Kurt Moll is out here just making us all like damn amateurs. This is ridiculous. <laughs> Not that you could miss them, but as we listen again, check out the strings and the flutes in unison going up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down. In half steps, Mozart takes the strings and flutes up and up and up, switching between a standard minor scale, a major scale with some wonkiness at the end, probably has a name, but I don't know what it is, and some straight, straight up modes like Phrygian. And if you don't know what the modes are, go look it up. Um, I am not a musical theorist and I am definitely not the best person to explain it. But in short, there are seven modes that sound weirder and weirder by my own definition. As you move through them, going up the scale just just go watch a video about it anyway switching between these scales serves to upend our sense of balance and harmonically make us and the characters feel unsteady and dramatically heighten the scene through the music itself Oh my god. I love, love this like little eeny meeny little ensemble moment that comes in. And it reminds me of some of the ensembles in La Notte di Figaro 
probably because they're just so fantastically Mozartian. One of the voices in the background, Leporello, actually leads the harmonic progression, while Don Giovanni sort of soars above it in an, a fantastic Samuel Raimi fashion. It's just amazing. Maybe not an ensemble, it's really more of like a duet with like a hint of a trio, just like a little flavoring of a trio. This interaction, or interjection I should say, reminds us where we are in space and time. Because Leporello says, I feel as if I have a fever, I cannot control my limbs. Very briefly, breaking the dramatic tension between the Commendatore and Don Giovanni. He feels the cold in the room that the Commendatore brings with him and is the only impartial observer that gives the audience perspective because the Commendatore doesn't address him ever or even seem to know or at least care that he's there. And this hammering, unrelenting rhythm from Commendatore That is a decision set in stone. So he's not going anywhere. But Leporello and Mozart bring us into the scene with this little 30-second ensemble duo, duet, whatever. <laughs> Strings again, and Leporello again. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> really like in the thick of it now. Why is the Commendatore here? So, who notices what's special about this scene? What's special about the grouping of singers here? Nobody? Three bass voices in an ensemble still able to create this amazing tapestry of drama and interesting harmonic and melodic progression. Mozart uses the depths of sonic waves to create the scene. And I'm at a loss for where this happens anywhere else, like in any other opera, in any other scene. If you know, please tell me, please enlighten me. He could have made Leporello a tenor. Why not? Probably because he's almost just as much to blame as Don Giovanni in his enabling of Don Giovanni throughout the entire opera is for nobody a love interest. But I think also because he knew that he wanted this interaction to be between three low voices. Call me crazy, but I think it's true. Don Giovanni, for his part, starts to mimic the Commendatore's vocal line, utilizing octaves now in the Parla, parla, something he only uses in commands. He used it once earlier in this scene talking to Leporello as a command, go get him a plate. So we know that he's getting frustrated as well with the Commendatore and he starts to be more brazen. Also, for whatever it's worth, in the very old edition of Don Giovanni that I was referencing while preparing for this, Don Giovanni is written as going back up to the high tonic, ascoltato, misto, but Remy chooses for the low one. I'm just saying. And here you can see his gorgeous costume up close, very Spanish in its frilliness and, and noble in its jeweledness. Cute. Oh, he looks so annoyed. You know he's in for it. Notice what he 
comes just the tiniest fraction ahead of the orchestra. This incessant rhythm in the strings. Okay, I'm sorry, but it's been almost a minute. I'm sorry, Leporello. You invited me to dinner, and now you know your duty. Answer me, will you come to dinner with me? Translation, will you accompany me to the pits of hell? Respectfully. I think it's great that we have these close-ups of Raimi because he is so, has such a gorgeous reaction and subtext going on that he's like, yeah. Shit. <laughs> and we're really getting to the limits of the basso profondo range for uh, Kurt Moll. This Errai on a D flat almost gets away from him a little. But I've heard Moll pop out an F like it weren't nothing. So I'm going to pin it down to how it's written and the day because it's still amazing. Like, it sounds easy, the Don Giovanni, uh, excuse me, the Commendatore line. But... There's a weird thing that happens when you're just going up and down steps. You your body thinks you have to do more than you have than you should. And so you start like fixing everything to go up just a half a step and then all of a sudden your larynx is like in the fifth row of the audience. So very very difficult um the commendatore line. Mozart <laughs> ever the dramatist has these fortepiano horns and timpani every time the commendatore re-enters. Yeah. <laughs> I have never understood this, and I know that I'm the one who's supposed to be explaining it, but like, this is a discussion. I can't have all the answers. It's fine. Leporello interjects, seemingly talking to the commendatore. Oi, bo, excuse me. Don Giovanni doesn't have time? Like, I'm pretty sure the commendatore doesn't give a shit about Don G's evening plans. Like, it doesn't really make any sense to me i don't i don't get this at all but at the same time he has this like it's like barely five seconds long and he seems to realize that nobody cares <laughs> nobody cares Don Giovanni doesn't care commendatore doesn't care and he just sinks back down hoping to not be noticed which he's not the commendatore doesn't even blink at him so like i i okay View. Oh my god, it's so high. Okay, we've now gotten to the crux of Don Giovanni, a character so set in his ways and so convinced or at least so stubborn, that in the face of death, he refuses to give up his lifestyle, his life of seduction, of trickery, of robbery, making a mockery of the name of love and marriage all at once, even though back in the day, those were really quite two different things. But regardless, don't forget that whenever he was seducing an unmarried woman, at least in the higher ranks of society, he was essentially taking away their marital worth and of course at this time that was their only worth they weren't allowed to work they couldn't earn money on, on their own so they had to marry to you know have a standing in society and that's you know a whole can of worms that i don't really want to open right now but even though the norms of society have changed a lot it's worth pausing to note the havoc he wreaked on the lives and the families that he touched even if he didn't think twice. Reeked? Ruck? What is the past sense of to reek? I think it's reeked. Now I don't know. Quote, 
No one will say of me that I have ever been afraid. How could he possibly be afraid when he hasn't had any other emotion besides lust throughout the entire opera? And I'm going to guess his entire life. Disregard even for the one closest to him, Leporello, laughing in Leporello's face at the thought of accidentally taking Leporello's wife to bed and threatening to kill him when Leporello has even the slightest inclination of not doing as he's told, even at physical peril to Leporello himself. When they found the Commendatore statue, Don Giovanni told him to go and look at the inscription, go talk to him. And Leporello was like, bro, I'm good. I'm, I'm fine. Don Giovanni pulls out a freaking knife on him. This man is deranged, you guys. He's not okay. Really, we should get Don Giovanni a therapist. Did anyone think of this? Well, no. So now that we've gotten ourselves already copyrighted, let's hope we don't get completely blocked and power through. Because now that Don Giovanni has made his decision, there's only one thing left to do. <laughs> Oh my god. I think it's obvious why this is one of the most epic scenes in all of opera, or at least all, all of Mozart opera. I think it's interesting that every other time that the sentence dammi la mano or anything related to hands has been uttered in this opera, it has to do with sex. La tirarem la mano being the very obvious example. And now it's sort of the exact opposite. And now that he grabs his hand, we realize where the cold is coming from that Leporello was demonstrating when he was like... <laughs> the Commendatore, just like death itself, exudes cold. And I think it wakes Don Giovanni up a little bit, realizing the danger that awaits him and Still, still he refuses to repent. A life without seducing women left and right is apparently a life that Don Giovanni doesn't want to lead. Okay, I know I said we'd go to the end, but that was a low D from Kurt Moll. With a, a, a low D with just as much resonance as the rest of his voice. And you can see, you can see and hear how he's modifying these vowels previously to keep the resonance as he goes down instead of pew, which is very closed, pew and small, obviously. Ooh, ooh, ooh is one of the most closed vowels. It's pio, right? And so it just still sounds like pew, but you can still sing on it. Let's listen again. What the hell? Oh, the hand on the shoulder. Watch the hand. The choir.
my god the uh, this whole production is just so well done i love the singers i love the staging i love the direction and obviously mozart and the ponte were in their groove when they worked on this together uh, the oh my god those faces oh my god i really like that the tempo that they oh i can't i can't talk I really like the tempo that they took for this because some versions, some like really earlier, older versions are very slow, much slower than this, which I get, like I understand the intention behind it, you know, it's death, it's slow, it's like creeping and inevitable, whatever, but the urgency that this tempo provides without it being too fast is just it's so interesting to think about the fact that Don Giovanni is only taken down by an otherworldly being. And I think it's key to what Da Ponte and Mozart were attempting to convey. The fact that a highly respected member of society, a Don, was so far from even having a moral compass, much less following it. You know, it was scandalous. And I know it's not their story, but of course it spoke to them. I think one of the things that saved this opera and saved it from being just canceled straight out and the fact that it was a massive success, people crying, long live Da Ponte, long live Mozart, echoing through the theaters after the premiere in Prague, was that some people interpreted the Don, Don Giovanni as a lost romantic, only conducting himself as he does because he was in search of the perfect woman huh? um i'll leave that up to you to decide i mean what do you think does don giovanni deserve this fate that he gets should people just like have not cared or whatever the the opera basically comes to a stop after this like there's still an ensemble with all the other characters remaining who are like great now we can like live our lives but it's sort of this weird appendix to the to the opera and i don't even know if it in this production is actually present because it's such like an anti-climax to have any music after this like just leave it right just leave it at this and let that be the point and there's just darkness you know that's it thankfully don giovanni is still very much set in the standard repertoire so a performance of the opera near you is probably only a stone's throw away look out for the patreon coming in february we'll be looking at more interpretations of this finale scene don't forget to subscribe follow me on instagram at opera.anna to opera up your life every single day and i will see you in the next one adio, adio.